Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, certainly want to thank Zach and Warren for uh, organizing this, putting this together. As Zach said, we work together on the multi-state group and uh, certainly have had some conversations, but this is really our first opportunity we've had to get together and present some of this work that we're doing at uh, a same site. So obviously as the outsider, I didn't have anything to do with the planning or preparations. I just got to uh, come out here and enjoy the hospitality and enjoyed my time yesterday and look forward here today sharing with you a little bit about what we've been doing. So uh, obviously this is about alternative systems. Zach mentioned several different things and really uh, in Illinois, we've done work in, in a variety of the same areas. I am going to hone in specifically on the calf and creep feeding, but uh, that's similar to here. We've done a lot of work with corn stock grazing, crop residue grazing, uh, basically any, anything that we can do alternatively uh, to, to grazing as our grazing days and our grazing acres are limited in many of our operations. So uh, like I said, alternative system is pretty difficult to define. I would probably say a traditional system might be as well, but I think when you hear about traditional system, hopefully we're thinking about cows out on grass, which is a good thing, right? Uh, cows utilize that forage in, in uh, many cases, it's acres that we can't use for anything else. And I always like to start by saying, I'm not suggesting that we don't do that, right? Every acre of forage that we have, we should figure out how to use it the best that we can. And that is a great place for cows. But the reality is we don't have enough acres of grass to support uh, the cows that we, we want to have in many places. A uh, number of reasons. I think uh, many of you can relate to this. Certainly where I'm from can relate to this. It started when I was, was a boy and saw fences started coming out, uh, you know, get a couple more rows of corn in the ditch. And that trend has, has continued. I didn't think it was possible to pull any more acres out of pasture, but uh, every time corn gets to six or $7, we figure out how to add a few more acres of, of crop production and we just continue to have less and less grass. Obviously, urbanization is added to that as well. Uh, there used to be a lot of cattle fed what is now the suburbs of Chicago, right? And that sprawl just continues to happen. In result, we have less grass. And so that really led us to, you know, what, what are we going to do? What are these different options? What are some alternatives? And we had a lot of producers that were considering some form and, and Zach mentioned this yesterday, and I would agree. We probably need to, to get together and work on our terminology. Uh, confinement, dry lot, you know, what, what are, there's a lot of things that we sometimes lump together that are actually pretty different. And what is a dry lot? Is a dry lot actually a dirt lot or is it concrete? And how much space are we talking about? That, that, there's a, a huge umbrella there. What I'm going to talk about in this facility, the, the blue sign there, the Ore Beef Research Center sits in Western Illinois, one of our three uh, beef cow-calf research stations we have. And what we use there is what was our winter feeding facility, concrete lots, open front buildings, okay? Each, and, and they're small lots, small pens, so we could do kind of small pen studies. So each of, each of these pins that we used historically for wintering our cows and doing a lot of our winter cow-calf uh, feeding work, there are these 36 by 36 foot concrete lots with 24 by 24 open front building that sits at the back of that. And then we bed those. So obviously small, um, but again, we have 12 of those, allows us to do some replicated work. So this first project that I'm just gonna highlight some of our findings, I'm not going to go into detail of this, but this is where we kind of started. Actually, I don't know, probably half a dozen years ago or more, we did it more as a demonstration. Uh, we used that same winter cow feeding facility, but instead of going to grass at breeding in April, we just kept them in. Kept them in in the summer and just tried to understand how would that facility work in more of an extended uh, housing through the summer months, what would be the challenges there. And then we decided to go ahead and do that as a research project. And obviously uh, comparing it to grass and a traditional system made sense. So that's what we did. That project was funded by Iowa Beef. I'm not gonna go through any of the details, but I'm gonna highlight a few of the conclusions. And I think most of them will make sense. Um, some of them also hopefully will lead to some ideas where we need to continue to do work. And I apologize, I know this, this screen and with the lighting, it may be difficult. Can you read any of that from the back? Okay, good. Uh, obviously, I'll, I'll talk about what's on there. In the dry lot or confinement or any of this, this would be true. We, we decide what we're going to feed them. 
right? So it should not surprise you that we are better able to maintain body weight and BCS. And, and we've proven that time and time again. Not that you can't maintain body weight and BCS on grass. You absolutely can. But we're at the mercy of Mother Nature. And some years that's a little harder to do than others. And are we on top of things to be able to adjust our stocking density or our rotational, if we're using rotational grazing or a rotational strategy, are we going to offer in some supplementation? What are we going to do in that year where um, it you know, hasn't rained for six weeks and pastures are getting dry and burn up? And certainly when we rely on primarily cool season forages in Illinois, that, that's a real issue as we get into July and August. So we can maintain body weight and BCS in the dry lot because we decide what to feed them. Repro wasn't different. And again, that, that's a good thing and not surprising. Um, you know, we would have to have an issue with body weight and BCS or BCS primarily for there to be a challenge there. So that's a good thing. One of the not so good things that we observed was we had more foot problems. And again, if you talk to anybody that uh, raises pigs or raises dairy cows, they'd probably tell you, well, yeah, we, we could have predicted that if you put them into a more concentrated setting, uh, confinement, you're likely going to deal with some challenges there. Our primary issue was uh, hairy heelwort, digital dermatitis. Um, we do have some foot rot, but we definitely have more issues. I think this is an area where we're going to have to work, is whether it's in a, in a building, on a bedded pack, or more of a lot. You know, you concentrate them, you get something in there, it's going to be hard to get out. And uh, we don't typically think about trying to get beef cows through a foot bath like a dairy. So what's our intervention going to be? How are we going to manage that? We got some work to do. Um, our dry lot calves had increased performance pre-weaning. I think as you look at some of these, and there'll be some data shared later today, as you look at a conventional system compared to an alternative system, you will see differences there. That's because there's a whole lot of different conventional systems and a whole lot of different alternative systems. And so I think it'd be pretty difficult to just say the calves will always do better in one or the other. Uh, in our system, when we're on cool season pastures and we're spring calving in you know, February, March, those calves are out on pasture July, August, alongside mother, they don't do as well as the calves that were in the dry lot. And also, it depends on what are you going to do with the calves in the dry lot, which a lot of my presentation today will focus on. Are you letting the calves get up to the bunk and eat the same TMR the cows are? If you are, they should probably do pretty well. Are you offering supplemental creep feed? If you are, they should probably outperform calves out on grass. If you're not providing any supplemental feed and you're limit feeding cows and limited bunk space and they're cleaning it up in a two or three hours, well, then now maybe those calves wouldn't do as well as if you were out on pasture. And also, if you're on a little better quality and availability of grass, you may not see the same decline in performance that we might in our system. Yes. Uh, AI. So we, we do synchronize and we do uh, timed AI on everything once, and then we put bulls in. Yep. Um, and then... This, this last bullet really will depend on the pre-weaning performance. Whichever group has poor pre-weaning performance, you probably could anticipate they'll have better performance after weaning. It's called compensatory gain, right? So if, if they're restricted and, and they're behind a little bit, you get them on equal playing field, offer uh, high plant nutrition to both. The group that was previously restricted should bounce back. And I'll show you some data where that continues to happen. So um, also at this same time of, of doing this study, we, we also, we had a lot of producers that were coming to us with more specific questions about their system, right? Uh, and I think this just shows the innovation of producers. They weren't waiting for research to tell them what to do. They're like, oh, we're already doing this, right? We, we need to figure out a way to raise cows, not on grass. And so we either put up a hoop building or we put up a monoslope or they were some people are doing like we did use their winter feeding facilities whether it's a dry lot an open front building they were doing this they're trying to figure out how to run more cows on less acres because they'd lost grass or whatever or maybe next generation wanted to come back to the operation they had to figure out how to diversify and expand let's let's add more cows and do it more in a confinement setting 
We did a survey among cow-calf producers in our state that were using some alternative systems. And uh, we got about 20 some respondents, which isn't a lot, but to have 20 people that are doing some sort of confinement cow-calf, we also thought that's probably a pretty good little cross-section. No surprise, we saw about every possible way of doing it. Um, you know, where there's multiple building types, multiple calving seasons, multiple weaning ages, multiple ways of managing this calf. Um, and, and so, again, we, we expected that, but it also uh, really shed some light on the fact that we need to hone in on best management practices in these systems. If you uh, maybe noticed, I did not tell you on the last slide which one was more economical. I usually get asked that. And, and I know it's a bad answer, but I always just say it depends. And sometimes it really doesn't matter. Uh, and the, I'll define both those. It depends because it depends on what you have to pay for grass. And it depends on what your availability is on alternative feedstuffs. If you're right next to an ethanol plant, and you can get modified distillers out of there pretty cheap, or if you have access to a lot of crop residue, you might be able to put together a TMR that's pretty low cost, All right? And if all the ground around you is selling for $15,000 an acre and can grow 280 bushel corn, the cost of seeding that to grass and trying to graze cows on that is probably pretty high, right? So um, that's why it depends. And then the reason I say sometimes it really doesn't matter is, is because some people say, I don't have a grass option. So I don't really, I don't really care to see your comparison to somebody else's opportunity cost on grass because I don't have that option. My only option is to go to one of these alternative systems. So please help me figure out how to do it best because that's my only option. We probably have more variability and more questions on the calf side, right? So what, what are we going to do with these calves? Are we weaning them at a more traditional age or we weaned them earlier? We creep feeding them, we letting them up to the bunk, we put up a building. Um, space is a huge thing. Bunk space is a huge thing. We can't maybe really afford to add that bunk space for the calf. Uh, adds a lot for the construction costs. So, so what do we do there? Do we add a, a special creep area for them to loaf and to eat? How are you doing that? So we did a little dig and tried to find some creep feeding work in a dry lot setting. Grad students did come across this study. Uh, it was published in 1978, obviously done prior to that. And I know those numbers may be a little small, but they'll draw your attention there. Those are final body weights, right? right? Slaughter weights, eight, 900 pounds. That, that's not very applicable, right? Uh, those are not the kind of cows we're running. I'm guessing those aren't, the, you know, someone's like, you sure those aren't hot, car hot carcass weights, right? That would be more in line with our hot carcass weights. So even though they saw some differences there, this information was not helpful to our current producers, right? These were different genetics, different system. So, and no offense to that work, I'm sure somebody 30 years from now, hopefully not sooner than that, will say what we're doing is outdated and irrelevant. Um, so not a lot of data, so what do we know? Well, there's a lot of other creep feeding work that's been done. So, you know, we kind of made sure we reviewed some of that literature. I just struggle to convince myself that that's very applicable though those cattle are on grass and so those calves have something to eat and if we creep feed that creep is substituting or replacing that forage base in a dry lot they don't have that it's a, it's a pretty different system so i'm not really sure that that information is super relevant to our dry lot or confinement systems so this graph here shows as you know calf weight goes up Basically, this is the, the requirement to, to meet their needs. And this is the, the uh, assumed beef cow lactation curve. So neither of those curves I really like, right? Because we know that we, we don't have a cow that's going to, beef cow that's going to make 50, 60 pounds of milk, um, nor would we want that. But I also think that I don't have a tremendous amount of faith and what we currently believe the, the beef cow's lactation curve to look like. Because we don't have a ton of data on that, right? We have a few snapshots in time. I believe some of those aren't necessarily measuring the genetic potential of that cow, but they're measuring what environment she was in. Again, if I think about one of our systems, if someone did do uh, an estimate of milk production on a spring calving cow and a cool season 
pasture in August. Well, I think you're probably testing how good the forage quality and availability was, not her genetic potential, right? She has to have the nutrition to sustain that milk production. But uh, regardless, we know that there, there's a gap, right? Calf requirement is, it's not going to be met by milk production. So what are we going to do? Or are we going to do anything? What happens if we don't meet that gap? Well, they're restricted. They're going to be behind. But if, if they can catch up later, maybe it's okay. But if they're so far behind that we've stunted them or uh, maybe, you know, predisposed them to future problems, whether it's health-wise or compromise grading potential, that, that would be a problem. If they're just behind and thin and they're going to bounce back, yeah, we could probably deal with that. So we set out, and, and this is the study that I'm going to go through, obviously, in, in more detail here, to determine what are the effects of creep feed duration on a primary focus was the calf, but obviously we wanted to collect the data on the cow side too to make sure there wasn't any any differences, even though you wouldn't really expect that. And we did follow the, at least the steer calves all the way through to slaughter. Um, we used that facility that I told you about with those concrete lots and open front buildings. Uh, we had 72 Sim Angus cows. You'll see here later I have their body weight, but they're pretty good sized cows. And I would say um, average to above average milk production for that kind of cross. Um, and we put six pairs in, in each of those pins. And there were three heifer calves and three bull calves at the start of the study in each of those pins. Bulls were castrated shortly thereafter. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on what we fed these cows. So that's not really the focus of this. What we found is you can feed them a lot of different things. You just need to formulate it to meet their energy and protein needs. Uh, Warren's going to share some, some different options. You, you should go with the least cost option, and it'll depend on what um, co-products or you know, byproducts are regionally available to you, what you have access to, what you can get bought in. Right now, probably feed some corn, feed some corn silage. Right? There's plenty of times where... Uh, corn stocks and a co-product like distillers is what a lot of our producers will find to be least cost. But it's going to vary. And uh, uh, I think you can get cows to perform on any of those. So cows were fed the same on this. Our focus was the calves. And what we did was we fed them a commercial creep feed for either 105 days or the final 21 days prior to weaning. We started this project when we time AI'd the cows for the next calf, right? So these calves were 83 days of age when we started. And we weaned at 188 days of age, plus or minus, whatever there. And so that's where we get the 105-day creep feeding period. So that was summer, okay? Um, and then on the short-term duration, as I'll sometimes refer to it, final three weeks. Those of you grad students in the room, you probably... I uh, have experienced this. I always want to maybe have another treatment or you can always think of, you know, a couple more things. We debated it on whether or not we should have a no creep negative control. But to be honest, I, I didn't really think that that's what I would recommend. I think there's plenty of work to show that uh, getting calves started on feed prior to weaning and going to the feedlots, advantageous, three weeks, two to three weeks, a, a fairly common recommendation. And I think that's especially important in a dry lot or a confinement, because they're not eating anything else. Maybe nibble at some bedding, right? A few of the uh, crumbs in the bunk. But uh, if we don't have any feed exposure prior to weaning, I think that's probably setting those cattle up for potential issues. So, so we went with three weeks. A little bit of timeline here. Again, kind of outlined this, but uh, you'll hear me refer to the pre-weaning phase as those first 105 days. Well, I'll call the kind of receiving or growing phase was... Uh, we shipped these from that unit to our feedlot on campus. And the first 42 days, we kind of separated that out as that receiving growing phase. And then the final 150 some days or whatever there would have been the um, finishing phase. And then those cattle, the steers were then uh, sent to Tyson. Uh, again, 12 of those pins, six pairs in each pin. Uh, square footage under the building works out to less than 100 square foot per pair. Uh, square footage on the concrete works out to about 200. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously a lot of differences in, in what people use there. One thing that, I, not to get in the weeds too much here, when we're talking about small spaces, small pins, I think that those square footage allotments are, are different. 
And I say that because the, the effective space is challenging, right? We have, if you would have made all of our facility one pin, there would have been four corners, but every pin has four corners. And those, you know, cows don't fit perfectly in those corners. So when you use the same square footage allotment, but break it into small pieces, it feels tighter. Um, and, and it is tighter. So I, I think it's obviously we report it that way. And, and a lot of times comparing people say, well, that's a, that's more allotment than what people are using. I'm like, I understand that. But I think if you, if you change this to a big pin, it, it'd look a little different, but that's what it was. Um, and if you can tell in this picture here, this is where we fed the creep feed. It's not what I would recommend, right? I would use some sort of uh, cell feeder or something. If you're going to do it, we did it this way so we could weigh it out and feed it every day get the warts back. It's obviously exposed to the elements there. Again, that was kind of a retrofit to this facility that typically had only ever been used in the winter. And up until those calves were this 80 some days of age and then went to the pasture. So that's, that's how we set that up to creep feed. So again, pre-weaning phase, we weighed several times throughout there, started the creep at 105. We came in day 42 and did our first ultrasound to determine the AI conception rate from that timed AI. We did do a way suck away uh, to determine milk production at this day 76. So again, that'd be um, 160 days into lactation there. Uh, and then started the creep at the end, final prey check right there. And then we did do ultrasound um, for uh, carcass composition, so longissimus muscle area, 12th rib fat, rump fat. If we're creep feeding, obviously one of the questions always there, well, were they fleshy? Was there going to be a fleshy discount? We want to make sure we could assess that. Track the cows, as I told you. I know there's a lot of numbers on there. The take home from that is, is the cows were similar. No differences in cow body weight, no differences in cow BCS between those two treatments. We would expect that. For the most part, we are able to maintain cow body weight, cow BCS. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that 6.2 is the ideal body condition score, but that's uh, probably a little, a little fatter than they need to be. But uh, that's where those cows were. We have seen as we've kept these cows in more and more, and we don't really have a period where they're going into negative energy balance, that they, they will kind of drift just a little fatter over time uh, because we're never really getting a, a reset, if you will. Milk production, not different. And again, this was kind of late into lactation there. Um, no difference. We wouldn't really expect that. I will back up. The only reason we thought there could have been a difference in cow body weight was um, we thought that the calves that didn't have creep feed, if they were hungry enough and tough enough, they may try to get up to the bunk and eat alongside the cow. We provided 30 inches of bunk space per cow. And that was a fairly energy dense limit fed ration that they were cleaning up in about three hours. The opportunity for those calves to get to the bunk at 30 inches per cow and three hours of them cleaning up, pretty limited. They would have had to have been pretty tough and pretty hungry to try and, and squeeze in there. You saw them try every once in a while, they might sneak a nibble, but uh, if they had eaten a, a significant amount, that would have meant there would have been less feed for their mother which may have shown up as those cows being different in weight and BCS, but they weren't. So it's kind of an indirect measure that the calves probably weren't eating much, which is what we observed. Commented on the, um, what was the breeding plan here? And so these cows were synchronized seven day cedar, time day AI, 75% um, first service conception, which we considered to be exceptional. Uh, as good as we've ever had. That is not the norm. Uh, this, this unit, this manager and these cows, they always do well. Um, it's, it's rare they're under 60. 75 would have been a record there. So we'll take that every time because it doesn't always go that way. Overall pregnancy in the 90s. So again, both were good. No problem at all. Can you explain why you chose to waste all the way um, later? Yeah, and so we wanted... In a perfect world, and especially now as I've gotten more into this uh, questioning our current knowledge of, of the lactation curve, I would love to have had somebody do it every week. I might have had all my grad students quit, but uh, uh, wanted to kind of see if 
hey, if if later in time there, when again, some had had creep the whole time and some hadn't, was there any difference in milk production or sustained milk production to kind of accommodate that? The, the creep feeding data on pasture suggests that it doesn't do anything to milk production. And, and I think ours kind of supports that. I wish we would have had lots. And way suck away is, it's a crude measurement. If you're not familiar with it, we separate the cows and calves, um, kind of midday, we let them nurse for 15 minutes that evening at say seven o'clock, separate them again. The next morning we come in, we weigh the calves empty, we let them nurse, we weigh them again. Their difference in weight change is considered to be 12 hours of milk production. It's, it gets us close. It, it beats the heck out of putting a milk machine on beef cow, which I had to do as a graduate student. Probably going to have some future graduate students do that. So, um, but it, it's, it is a way of getting the milk production. Okay, so uh, good question. Transfer here to the calves. At the start, no difference in calf body weight. That's kind of by design. You wouldn't want them to be different at the beginning. And then already um, by day 42, the calves that had creep feed weighed more than the ones that didn't. Not a surprise. That's what you would expect. Day 84, um, they'd separated by, you know, 75, 80 pounds. And then day 105, they come back together just a little bit. And that would make sense if you look down here at the, the average daily gains. I do want to point out here, so first first two periods, creep-fed calves, over three pounds a day, just pretty good. Non-creep-fed calves, two and a half, which is also really good. That's better than I thought it was going to be. That's what our calves will do on pasture with their mother, right? And so that surprised me. Like, what, where, where's that coming from? Right? The, if they're not really eating much out of the bunk, we're not giving them anything else. Yeah, they could pick up the bedding a little bit, but I really think it comes back to maybe there was more sustained milk production through there than the models would have told us. And also, if they're only consuming milk, maybe they stay more efficient on that, all right? And, and so I think we, we don't understand or, or know as much about that because we don't have a lot of beef calves that have only ever been fed milk for that period of time to really know what are they capable of gaining on just, just milk alone, because we, we don't do that, right? So um, I, I think that's surprising, but encouraging numbers. And if you go to when we offer them creep, they bounce up really good. In those last three weeks, they did over you know three and a half pounds a day. Um, so some compensatory gain. This number is a little low. I, the only thing I can tell you, I'll show you their intakes here in a minute. We had a little heat spell there. I think those calves backed off a little bit. The other thing I will tell you is tracking gain over three weeks is tricky because you have some differences in, in gut fill, and that really gets magnified when you try and, and um, calculate an average daily gain over just a few days. It doesn't take very many pounds difference in fill to throw off that average daily gain. Oops. Last number I want to draw your attention to is this supplemental gain to feed. And if we would make that a, a feed to gain, that's, uh, um, I guess, like six, seven to one. And that's a thing, supplemental gain to feed that you see in creep feeding work. So when we, when we creep feed on pasture and we offer creep, some of that creep replaces forage, right? And so oftentimes people kind of complain about, hey, this thing's we're eating 10 pounds of creep feed but they, they didn't get very much more extra gain. Their efficiency on that creep feed was, was terrible. And that's because in a pasture setting, it's just replacing the forage. It's not really a, a, a net benefit or certainly not all a net benefit. In the dry lot, it is, it's not replacing anything. So this supplemental gain to feed is better than what you'll see in any other creep feed literature on pasture because it's not replacing anything. So that's good. If you are going to offer that creep, you're really getting a little more bang for your buck on that because it, it truly is all going to gain and not just replacing your, your forage base. Yeah, so question is, is how can you tell if the, um, if the creeps raising or, you know, helping the calf grow or the cow's milk is? And I guess I would just kind of come back to comparing those two when we didn't have creep. That's obviously only on the cow, and that's where we got the two and a half pounds per day gain. When we had creep plus the, the cow, we were more like three and a half. So that's our best way to kind of tease that out. 
And then as far as um, keeping replacements, I, I will hit on that a little bit later here when I talk about the flesh and the condition. Um, I would not recommend creep feeding uh, potential heifer replacements. There's really no benefit and potential for, for negatives there. But thanks, thanks for those questions. And again, if I didn't answer that specifically, I encourage you to you know put something else again in the chat there, and I'll try and revisit that. This graph here is on, on the creep feed intake. And so the orange line would be for those 105-day creep. Started pretty low, just gradually worked their way up. Here's where I told you they kind of backed off right through here, stalled out a little bit. That may have been a uh, due to a heat event right there. I think the important part is, is when we offered creep to the short term, they went up on it quick, right? And by three weeks, there's no difference in intake between those two, whether they'd been on it the whole time or only been offered it in three weeks. And so we got right up to about 10 pounds um, per head per day at the end. Uh, quick, quick. How many days until the calves are really consuming the creep? Yep, so on, on this... These calves, when we started, would have been 88 days of age. And so we didn't offer it prior to that. And so um, what is represented here as week one would have been when those calves would have been about three months of age. And they started right out in that first week at a pound per day. And, you know, every week, basically, over the next next 10 weeks, they were adding a half a pound or a pound intake each, each week. Um, we've done some where we've offered creep earlier than that. And uh, sometimes they'll get started on Sometimes it just takes one calf to get in there and get started. There's probably more variability at that young age. At this later age, when we come in here, they, they pretty well all go to it. There's not as much variability. Great question. And I, I did not uh, draw attention to that. It is, um, there is corn. Corn is, there's more corn than co-products, but it's pretty similar and it, there was some distiller's grain, some soy holes. So there is a combination there. I wouldn't characterize it as a high starch, but it's not a, it's not a no corn. It's kind of an intermediate. And I'll come back to that. So that's a good question. Yeah, I like it. It was. We did bunk feed it daily, but the goal was for it to be ad libitum. So we were trying to have just a little bit of refusal. So yes, we pushed them and let them have as much as we could. Good. Thank you. Told you we ultrasounded these calves, right? They're gaining three and a half pounds a day. They're probably um, potential to be a little fleshier. Longissimus muscle area, there was a difference here. Uh, whenever there's a difference, and we know there's a weight difference, I like to do that per unit of weight. And there was not a difference when we do that calculation. So what's that mean? They weren't heavier muscle. They were heavier. Right? And so if they're heavier, they're going to scan with a larger rib eye or a larger longissimus muscle area. They were fatter. 12th rib and rump fat shows they were fatter. Visually, we could see that. We um, expected that, but we wanted to have the numbers to, to verify that. IMF. I had the question about the, the creep composition. Uh, some of you may know, University of Illinois has done a lot of work on this kind of early calf nutrition, whether it's been creep feeding, early weaning. And a lot of that's focused around marbling deposition. And certainly my predecessors and some of my graduate work was in that area. And I do believe that there is an opportunity to influence marbling at that young age, 100 to 200 days of age. There's, there's a window there where those uh, intramuscular fat cells can still differentiate and increase in number. And we have to have enough energy. And uh, I think there's... Certainly some work that would suggest the right source of energy and starch being key to that. Uh, and so, and, and we can talk more about that later if that really does interest you. So we thought, hey, that's going to be important to assess this. There could be some differences in intramuscular fat. Was it significant? And I'll come back to the fact that that wasn't a, a really high corn, really high starch based creep. And so maybe that's part of it. But I'll also point out that these calves, they did have three weeks of creep at the end. And I'll also draw you back to the point that they weren't on grass, right? So what they were getting was primarily milk, which again, we don't have some of that other creep feeding data that's out there. Um, those were all on pasture base. So, and, and so some people would say, ah, I don't think creep really affects marbling anyway. And so they're not surprised. Others would say, oh, I think I, think I would have guessed there to be a difference. Sorry, I had some boxes there. 
little pre-weaning summary then. We're doing all right on time. Uh, cow performance and repro were not impacted by creep feed duration. It's good. We wouldn't, wouldn't expect that. Um, the long-term creep resulted in greater average daily gain, greater body weight. Again, we would expect that. You feed them, they grow faster. Resulted in them being fleshier. Also expected that, but I think it was good to put some numbers on it and document that. And then the short-term creep during that period of time, they compensated. All right? So again, compensatory gain is that rapid, efficient gain following a period of restriction. I would say it would be safe to say that those calves that didn't have creep were restricted for those first 84 days. And then we offered them creep and they bounced back a little bit. Now, it wasn't enough to make up all the difference, but they were sure made up some of that difference in those final three weeks. If you saw on the objective, I didn't say it out loud, I guess, it said something about rumen fermentation characteristics. And so um, what we wanted to do here, my colleague, Dr. Josh McCann, does more on the uh, rumen microbiome. And, and he thought, hey, this would be a good idea to, to actually assess this and look at this. I told you the reason we offered creep for three weeks prior to going to the feedlot is to make sure that they had feed exposure, make sure that rumen development had occurred and they were ready for feed. So we wanted to go in and see, hey, prior to that, when some had had creep, some hadn't, is there any differences? And so to do that, we took rumen fluid from calves out of both treatments. And so that's kind of the ex vivo. So rather, if you've done any in vitro work, hey, we just get rumen fluid and we test the feed. Well, we got rumen fluid from two different sets of cattle. So it was kind of a different base, right? It, it would represented the rumen from these different management strategies. And then we did the in vitro experiment. You got to show this. My grad student made it. I didn't. But uh, uh, obviously the idea there is we get the feed exposure and we get these, these bugs and we get the right kind of rumen development. Okay. So again, at this time at day 76, just picture it as creep, no creep, right? Because the short term hadn't had it yet. So it's creep, no creep. And what we found was the calves that had creep, rumen fluid from them, resulted in greater in vitro dry matter digestibility, which supports that that rumen community was better, was better prepared and more developed. We also saw a difference between our substrates. Not surprising, our creep feed was more digestible than the cow TMR. So that part's not surprising. And there wasn't an interaction. A lot of numbers here. The, I'll draw your attention to the total VFA. There was an interaction, but it supports the same theory. Regardless of substrate, we had more VFA production when they had been exposed to creep than when we didn't. Um, and so I'm glad we did this. It kind of documented that. I'm not going to show you the data, but we did it again when they came to the feedlot. So at that point, They'd either been on creep for 105 days or they'd been on creep for three weeks. No difference, right? No difference in any of these things, which once again supports that three weeks was enough to prepare that rumen. And, and I think that's important. Had we gone with these calves right here to the feedlot and started them on feed, I don't think we would have got some of the same results that we did at that early part of that receiving period. So now for the receiving phase, we truck them to campus, all right, here's our receiving growing ration, silage, corn, hay, distillers. We get the hay out pretty quick. We're on a slatted floor there at campus. Uh, weight them every two weeks during that period. Kind of a summary of the, the body weights here. They started different. They stayed different the whole time. But during that period, the short-term creep fed calves had greater average daily gain. They're still compensating. Okay. Right? They were intake was similar, all right? They tend to be more efficient. And again, that's the compensatory. That's what we see. If you take a set of contemporaries, restrict one to a lower body weight, and then put them back on the feet, they'll eat the same. It's kind of fascinating that they'll eat the same as their counterparts, even though they weigh less. So they're eating a greater percentage of their body weight. And since they weigh less, they have a lower maintenance cost. So more of that intake is going to gain. And that's how they end up being, being more efficient. Oh, I guess the last thing to point out there, still didn't catch them. Narrowing the gap. Remember, we were 75, 80 pounds at the, uh, at the most, and now it's more like 35 or whatever. So short-term creep, greater average daily gain, 
tend to be more efficient. Long-term creep, still heavier. 42 days wasn't enough for them to come together. So now, finishing phase. Take you back to the beginning. I said there's six pairs in each pin, three heifer calves, three male calves. At this juncture, the heifers were sorted off as potential replacements. The steers, we co-mingled. We'd maintain, pin, even when we came to the this facility for that receiving phase, we still kept those six calves from their dam's pin in their own pen. For the finishing phase, we co-mingled, managed them all together. From a statistical standpoint, our dam pen was always an experimental unit, and we maintained that, but we, we, you, we fed them together. Question may come up, and, and I'll hit on this since there was already a question about the replacements. No, we didn't track the heifers all the way through. It's 36 of them. It's not enough. I think it's a really important question. Um, I, I would just tell you I would not creep feed my potential replacement heifers. There's, there's too many potentials for negatives. One, it costs more. Two, if we do get them fat and fleshy, there's data that shows that creep feeding can, can lower milk production, seeing as much as 25% reduction in lifetime milk production. If you creep feed those calves, especially if you do it for a long period of time and get, get them fleshy, you're just, it's pretty unlikely in a commercial setting that you recoup those dollars and you may cost you more. If you're in a purebred seed stock, trying to market these at an earlier age, you might be able to justify getting those calves a little bloomier earlier. That's a different scenario. Finishing phase, here's our um, finishing rations we used here. Again, we, we use silage as our, our forage base. Um, corn, high moisture corn, modified distillers. Pretty typical for our part of the world. Um, we did implant these calves day 148, day 223. We used the TEIS for the first one, TES for the second one. Um, they were co-mingled, so we couldn't have intake. I don't like three animals in a pen. That's not enough to really get a good pen average. So that's why we didn't keep those pens, but I still wanted to see if there's any intake differences. So um, since they're all together, we did use our grow safe system. If you're not familiar with that, use an electronic ID allows you to get individual feed intake in a pen setting. So we could keep them co-mingled and still know what each calf ate. We did that just at the end. Again, it have been great to do it the whole time. Didn't really have the dollars budgeted to do that. So, um, and then at the end, we shipped them to Tyson. We have a packing plant there in Illinois, in Joslin, Illinois, about three hours from campus. And we got a full set of carcass data. So, Right here at the beginning of this finishing phase, now it's just the steers. So if you're like, hey, those numbers don't quite match before. Before it was an average of the heifers and steers. This is just steers. So um, about 60 pounds difference here. So a little bigger difference than when the heifers were mixed in. But by day 238, not statistically significant. And by the end, not statistically significant. You might say, hey, there's a little bit of numerical difference there. And I'll come back to that. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, I like to point out this number right here. Ooh, they're both really good, but 4.8 pounds per day for those first uh, 90 days in the finishing phase for those short-term creep calves. They were still compensating, right? So still exceptional rate of gain, making up for that. And that's why at the end, they weren't different. Now, when we came in here for the last days and did our intake evaluation, feed efficiency, no difference in intake, no difference in gain, no difference in feed efficiency. So by that last kind of 60 days, they, they were the same, right? They'd fully compensated and caught back up from a growth performance standpoint, which is pretty cool if that can happen consistently. Maybe asking about the carcass data. Well, hot carcass weight, actually numerically identical. So if there was a little bit of a numerical difference on live weight, there was a little bit of numerical difference here on our dressing percent, not significant. And I, I wanted to follow them through and get this. But, you know, we're a little short on numbers, and I acknowledge that. We're powered good for everything up through that receiving phase, but when we drop those heifers out, um, you know, one, one individual in a pen of three can kind of skew some numbers a little bit. About a half inch of fat, right, 3.0 yield grade, no difference in marbling, back to there wasn't any difference in IMF um, there at the end of the pre-weaning, so wouldn't really expect there to be a marbling difference at the end. So summarize that, 21-day calves, they compensated. Now, they'd been compensating, but they hadn't caught up, but now they have. They have caught up, no difference in uh, gain or feed efficiency of those final 60 days, because they'd already caught up. 
and no difference in carcass traits. So what about economics? And I'll, I'll circle back to the question you know, that came in the chat relative to economics between a grazing system and a dry lot or a confinement system. And I'll kind of reiterate what I said there. That really depends because you got so many moving parts, right? What's your grass cost? What's your feed cost? Here, comparing these two systems, well, they're in the same thing, right? Almost all the costs were, were identical, right? We had the same space allotment. Cows were fed the same. The only difference in these two treatments was how long they had creep, right? So that's, and there wasn't any difference in intake in the receiving or finishing phase. So there wasn't any difference in, in feed costs and, and that stage, so our only difference is in this creep feeding period. So we did want to do some economics here. We use three-year averages when we do this. You know, we could argue what's the best way. Um, sometimes longer-term averages make sense. If we think we've entered a new era, sometimes including historical data isn't very relevant. We could, we could argue that for a while. Feeder calf value, again, three-year average. We did, we did use a fleshy discount, and we did have a weight slide in there since there were some differences in weight. We know that affects feeder calf value. Carcass value, again, we used uh, three-year averages for base price and premiums and discounts associated with quality and yield. When we look at the kind of partial economic analysis here through the wean calf value, there was about an $83 difference in creep feed costs. If you creep feed them for 105 days, it's going to cost you more than if you creep feed them for 21 days, right? Uh, you would expect that, $83. They were worth more. Um, and again, here's where some of those variables, you know, how fleshy are they? Are you going to get a fleshy discount or not? We put one on. If we wouldn't have, they might have been worth a little bit more. But uh, we thought, uh, considering the flesh they were at, it made sense. Uh, we end up with a $42 advantage to the long-term creep. But uh, I'm not going to spend 83 to make 42 right? That doesn't make sense. So the short-term creep were $40 more profitable if you sell them at weaning. Now, uh, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to, to click through that. If we look at it through the final carcass value, we have the same feed costs. We go here and actually, just the way it worked out with uh, the, the marbling score wasn't different. We had a few more that went CAB. And I think we had one more prime on that. And so when you put the individual premiums on there, we actually end up with a $19 difference favoring the short term. So we combine that, we got over $100 profit more by only creep feeding for three weeks compared to creep feeding for the whole time. So in conclusion there, that long-term creep did improve calf weight prior to weaning. Um, creep feeding for 21 days does appear to be sufficient for preparing that rumen. Again, base that on two things, the ex vivo data, and the fact that in that receiving period, they took off right away. If, if, they're, if they weren't ready to go, we might not have seen some of that compensatory gain in that receiving phase. It may have been a little more delayed, but they hit the ground running. I would say that we had them ready. And ultimately, creep feeding for three weeks saved cost. Um, still had them ready and didn't jeopardize final carcass merit. So uh, like any, anything, no one study answers all questions. But I, I do think this has helped some of our producers and, and you know, we're gonna, gonna do some more of this, gonna hopefully work with some producers on farm for them to try and track a little bit of their data. Um, I think just our, our initial reaction would be, well, we gotta feed them something. They can't, they can't have no feed, right? They can't just be in this dry lot. They don't have grass. We gotta, we gotta let them come up to the bunk. And I know some recommendations are to allow for enough um, space so the calf can get there too, or add additional TMR feed to account for what those calves can eat. And um, I would say this one study would say that may not be true. And we need to continue to work on that because if they will catch up later, it makes no sense to try and do it then, right? Now you gotta make sure you get the value, right? If you're retained ownership, that's easy to capture that. If you're gonna sell them at weaning, you need to make sure you're getting the appropriate premium for this thin, calf that's going to, you know, maybe go have five pounds a day, average daily gain because of the compensatory gain. Um, I mentioned that first study was funded by Iowa Beef Industry Council. This one was funded by the Illinois Beef Association. Obviously, none of this is possible without the grad students. Megan Myerskoff uh, did the first one. Lindsay Pugh did this one. Actually, both of them have 
the be employed by Perina now and uh, did a fantastic job when they were with us. So with that, be happy to answer questions you have. Yes. Did you track the yep. Yep. Great question. Uh, was there, and I'll repeat that for those of you on, on Zoom, and I apologize if I didn't do that earlier. Uh, was there any differences in treatment or health records there? Um, we had very, very few respiratory, which is a good thing. Uh, but when you have so low numbers, we treated like one or two on each treatment. And so there wasn't anything significant. And I didn't report it because they were just so low. With these kind of numbers, to pick up a difference in health treatment statistically, we would have had to have treated like 50% in one of them and zero in the other. I, I don't really think that there should be differences, though. Again, if... If our non-creep fed or late creep fed calves had only been doing one and a half pounds a day and really looked stunted or behind or unthrifty, then I would maybe have been a little worried about them. But they're gaining two and a half pounds a day and they had the three weeks of creep where they really did well. Yeah, they were thinner, but they did not look like they were, you know, at risk. Any differences in feed deliveries to the cow herd between bands either creep fed or not during the year? During the feeding period, there more feed delivered to the cows. No, we limit fed, so we I mean we fed the same amount to to all the pens, and and I wish we had a way to to, to track it, um, but but we don't. You know, at that is they were bunk fed, but that's why we we did. I had some undergrads uh, that did some observations, and, and this last year we did a different study, and we really tried to do that more because we um, the study we did this past summer we looked at a energy dense limit fed TMR similar to this where they're cleaning up in two or three hours and then a bulkier higher corn stock inclusion one where it was really in the bunk for more like six seven eight hours and we counted number of calves at the bunk like every hour I say we undergrads did that and there there were on the bulky the cows they got full and they walked away before it was gone and then we did see some calves up there um, still pretty minimal but in this study where they're both where they're all limit fed, those cows just, they stay at the bunk till it's gone. And those calves really don't get up there. They don't have much chance. Any behavioral issues show up? Yeah, um, yes, we, we have some of that. Uh, I And, you know, there was yesterday, we had a conversation and a gentleman that, that works with some hoop building say that that, that kind of goes away over time. Uh, cows that had, I think he was sharing if that once they'd been in there for a couple years and never left, it, it kind of starts to go away. And I wonder if we've seen some of that because I will tell you these, these cows, um, they, they didn't just go into this facility when we started, they'd been in there all winter, right? This was our wintering facility and they'd been wintered in there the year before. And some of these cows had been on some of our extended dry lot and, and we limit feed, uh, you know, higher energy ration pre-calving as well. And so I, I think we maybe don't see as much of that as if you took a set of, you know, cows that had been only on range and then put them in there and said, hey, you're going to only get to eat for two hours. I think we would observe. We see some of it, but we're mostly pipe. And, you know, we don't have as many things for them to chew on. And it's not a dirt lot. It's concrete. So it's not like they're eating the dirt or some of the things you see sometimes. But Yeah. And we will see that a little bit in the spring or, I will tell you if we if we use the heat detection patches, they don't stay on very good in our in our dry lot. Those cows, they uh, it's totally different than when they're out on grass. We don't hardly ever lose a patch out on grass in a dry lot. It only takes one cow to figure out that she's good at ripping them off, and they're they're gone. So we use a, an Aloka five fifty. I'm not not an expert on that, but uh, they're I would say they're not. You know they're not cheap. We use them in, in a research setting as far as what could be available um, for a, a commercial application. You know, if you have purebred cattle, you can hire someone to come and ultrasound your calves for a fee. And I, I mean, even with commercial, you can it, be cost prohibitive. But there are there are people that will come scan your cattle there. No. Uh, any recommendations for portable or quick assessment for marbling or IMF? No, the, I mean, a live animal, really, our only option to assess that would be to utilize ultrasound. And, and it has its own set of challenges there. But certainly, if you use a, a certified technician and those are go through, like the cup lab, the central processing, that data is pretty good. But 
there's a cost associated with that. Did you feed them so the heifers didn't come into heat? Um, and so I uh, may be re referring to MGA. We did not have MGA in there again. These heifers and steers were co-mingled up until that end of that receiving phase. So those cattle would have been about 220 days of age. We wouldn't have had any heifers cycling at that point. And then at that juncture, the heifers uh, came off study and we only had the steers on study from that point forward in the finishing phase. It was a, uh, is the creep pelleted or loose? It was a pelleted creep feed, commercial creep feed that we used. Um, just so happened that the uh, local feed mill there, our extension specialist, Travis Mateer, whose name is on here, he's been an integral part of all of this confinement work we've done. He's kind of worked with them on developing that. I don't think it has to be a pelleted, but that's what we used. Mm -hmm.